PayTOS um, allows you to add links to the actions you can perform with the data you're returning. So imagine a tweet and imagine, for example, just a link is just an object with some arrays and one of the links could be uh, a retweet link or like a favorite link or like a delete link. And each link contains um, like a, a type, which is like the HTTP type. It contains the URL to where you perform this action and it also contains like a, a name. So kind of human readable kind of name. So like like, retweet, delete, stuff like that. Welcome to the Modern.net Show. Formerly known as the .NET Core Podcast, we are the go-to podcast for all .NET developers worldwide, and I am your host, Jamie Gebrogman-Taylor. In this episode, I spoke with Sander Tebrinke about HateOS and HTMX. These are two separate but complementary technologies and design patterns which help to build reactive web applications. In fact, as Irena pointed out back in episode 2 of the current season, which was released on September 22nd, 2023, you're likely not building RESTful services if you're not doing HateOS. And HTMX is something, as you'll find out, which aims to simplify building HTML-based apps that utilize web-based APIs by taking care of the boilerplate JavaScript code that you might need to include using a series of attributes that you can place on your HTML elements. So HTMX is, uh, in the principle, it's a, it's a JavaScript library, which you can use, you know, so you, uh, you, can, you can use it in your application. Uh, to write a whole lot uh, less JavaScript. So, you know, in let's let's think back uh, to the good old days, right, where we were writing like uh, Web 1.0 applications, and our servers uh, were simply like we're using like HTML templating engines, which they still do. It worked and it worked fine, but it wasn't very interactive because then we kind of got to the point where we were like, you know, we want to do some cool clients application, but we don't want to reload the page the entire time. And that is kind of where the, the spa movement came along. We want to be able to have a rich interactive application where clicking a button or clicking multiple buttons, the, just a, a bit of the page refreshes, right? That's kind of the web 2.0, I suppose. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET new podcast, and we'll dive into the core of modern.net. So, Sandra, welcome to the show. It's been it's been a while. Uh, we've been trying to get this going, and I I keep having things come up, so I apologize for that. But yeah, it's it's wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much. So we uh, we met. Back at MVP Summit, um, the most recent one, because I'm not sure when this one's going out. So, yeah, we met at MVP Summit, and actually, I remember, right, little peek behind the curtains. I remember uh, it was during breakfast. I'd gone yeah, downstairs was, for I breakfast, was, yeah. and I had my my .NET Core podcast hoodie, and we started a conversation with that. <laughs> I was kind of looking for like other MVPs in the hotel, you know, to kind of talk to and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I recognized you, and I recognized the show as well. So I thought it was really exciting. It was really fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, networking. It's like uh, LinkedIn <laughs> for real life. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, uh, like I said, welcome to the show. Um, I was wondering, um, would you give the listeners a bit of an elevator pitch, like a quick description of you know, who you are, the kind of work you do, that kind of thing, all that kind of exciting stuff so that everybody knows a little bit about you? Sure thing. So my name is uh, Sander ten Brinke. I am from the uh, Netherlands and uh, I work as a senior software engineer at Arcadi uh, in Zwolle, which is a uh, consultancy company. And uh, besides that, I'm also a Microsoft MVP, well, which you've already probably understood from now. So I've been an MVP since last year, which I was super, super happy uh, to become. I mostly focus like uh, as a programmer on doing stuff with like .NET and Azure and stuff like that. Those are really mainly my focus points, but I also like doing like front-end developments or I did some game development in the past, some app development, DevOps, basically everything that kind of, you know, is interesting to me, I love doing. And uh, yeah, besides all of that, I like to do, you know, write some blogs on my websites, uh, speak at meetups and conferences, uh, doing a bit of open source or organizing some small events 
like Oktoberfest, stuff like that. So I like to keep myself busy. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, um, I I fully appreciate the the content creation side of everything and sharing the knowledge because I'm very similar, right? I don't don't get to talk at conferences so much these days, but I love putting out content for people to sort of learn and grow from. That's why I do the podcast, right? Um, is is that why you do it, or are you just like ah, free time sucks? I'm just going to write all the blog posts. No, it, it kind of. I still haven't really can't really easily explain why I do it so much. I just, in general, like sharing knowledge. I remember uh, a few years ago, uh, my boss asked if I would like to speak at a conference and stuff like that at some point in my career. And uh, I said, if there's one thing that I never, ever want to do, it's to speak at a conference. And now I, you know, doing it like, I don't know, like multiple times per year. So something really changed there. I think for me, it just really developed organically where I like, you know, like sharing knowledge with colleagues and stuff like that. And just, I really like learning every day. So why not, you know, share it within colleagues. And then I just kind of got challenged slowly to, you know, share it in a presentation and stuff like that. And then I was like, why not write a blog post? And it kind of, you know, at some point when you're like sharing it online and stuff like that, you get all of that feedback that just makes you want to write more and more. You just get, start appreciating it more. Totally. No, I, I, I fully uh, uh, appreciate what you're saying. I fully agree with you. Um, there's something from my teacher training days, which is sitting at the back of my brain and saying, hey, mention this. So long time listeners of the show will know that I trained to be a high school teacher uh, just out of uni before I started my dev career. And um, the one of the great things about giving a talk or writing a blog post or producing any kind of content is that in order for you to fully understand the thing that you're trying to teach, Teaching it helps you to... Let me try that again. Yeah. No, we'll keep that in. We'll keep that flub in. That's fine. Um, In order to teach something, you really need to know it. But the act of teaching it helps you to reinforce the knowledge you already have, which is one of the reasons why I always used to get... um, In my my lessons, I would get the students up at the end and say, tell me what you learned, right? Do a, a mini presentation about what you learned today because it would reinforce that, that uh, the day's learning way better than homework ever does. Um, and, you know, everybody hates homework anyway. But yeah, yeah I totally you get, like, get a bit of the, interaction yeah. and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so one of the things that I would love to talk to you about um, is this hate OS, which sounds like a Linux distribution, right? But it's something to do with APIs, right? I know REST, I know SOAP, I know WCF, all those kinds of things. But hate OS, what's this? So Hate2S is definitely not a Linux distro, though. Like lots of people I tell about, uh, you know, I talk about Hate2S, think that it is because, you know, kind of ends with OS and stuff like that or AS. Uh, so Hate2S is kind of, it stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State, which is, you know, an acronym uh, you're not going to remember. And <laughs> what it basically does is ins- it enriches your API response and it can be extremely, extremely useful. That's kind of really in a nutshell. Cool. Okay. Um, so is it, is it, okay. So let's say I want to use hate OS as part of an API. Yeah. It like, what am I doing here? Right. Cause like my APIs will usually return a JSON blob with some data in it. Am I still returning that JSON? Uh, do I need to? Am I still using like RESTful get and put and post? Like how how do I implement that? Exactly. You know, you're, you're, that's that's exactly kind of right. So what you I like explaining it in like the, the I like explaining it as follows. I always use like Twitter or I, should, I guess I should call it X now as an example. So imagine we're looking at you know just a basic Twitter uh, application. Um, and we would be returning a tweet, right? So as JSON, we would be returning stuff like an ID, uh, user ID, uh, and a tweet, the amount of favorites, the amount of likes, right? That's just the model, just some data JSON that we're sending over the line. Mm-hmm. So with that data, your your app is going to you know render some stuff on the screen, but the app only knows that only knows your data as data. It doesn't know what to do with it. Hate2S um, allows you to add links to the actions you can perform with the data you're returning. So imagine a tweet. 
And imagine, for example, just a links is just an object with some arrays. And one of the links could be uh, a retweet link or like a favorite link or like a delete link. And each link contains um, like a, a type, which is like the HTTP type. It contains the URL to where you perform this action. And it also contains like a, a name. So kind of human readable kind of name. So like like, retweet, delete, stuff like that. Okay, so I'm imagining that I can return, like you said, right, I'm returning the data and some things I can do to that data, right? So it makes, presumably, it makes my UI easier to build, because if I'm saying here's the data and here's what you can do with it, then I don't need no logic in my UI, right? Oh, yeah, that's that's kind of exactly it. Like, if I had to give, like, a real elevator pitch about the usefulness of hey to us, that would really, yeah, that would be definitely be the definition of it. Um, cause imagine, and you're building like a front end application and like basically all of these front end applications are built like this nowadays where you're returning data from your API, like a tweet, and then somewhere in your front end, uh, you're building the actions based on that entity. So for a tweet could be a retweet. So there might be some logic connected to it. Like, uh, you're only allowed to retweet it, um, uh, if you haven't retweeted it yet or something like that, if that would be valid logic, or maybe downloading and um, deleting an invoice when it hasn't been improved yet, something like that. There's logic attached to actions. Uh, sure, okay. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to say it. And uh, that you might think, yeah, that's just something that every application has to do. But then you come to realize that the server is performing these exact same actions. When I'm, for example, deleting a tweet, and there's some logic connected to it. Uh, just like uh, the owner is only allowed to delete a tweet. You check that in the front end to show a delete button. And then you're also, when you're performing the delete action on the server, you're performing the exact same action again, which is duplicate code. Okay. I can also imagine perhaps that um, because it reduces the, it potentially reduces the amount of code on the front end, it, lightly reduces the attack surface so like if in your example right i can delete this thing if i'm the owner of this thing what's stopping me from hitting f12 hitting the breakpoint on the do you own this thing yes allow it to delete right whereas i guess with hate os if if the ui is being built based on that response that button's only going to be there if the if the server tells me i can put that button there right yeah, I guess it could be a bit a bit better. I mean, you could still uh, forge a network request anyway if you know what the URI would be. So I don't really think it matters security wise. I think the most the biggest benefit really is um, the removal of lots of logic from your front end, what you already mentioned, because your front end no longer has to have the duplicate code. Your front end can simply check, like, is there a delete link available in the links array? If so, I don't even care what the logic looks like. I can just now render the delete button. Okay. And with that reduction of duplicated logic, right? Everybody talks about don't repeat yourself, right? So yeah. with the reduction of that duplicated logic, if it changes on the back end, where the rule is now, you can delete it if you're the owner and it's Tuesday and you recently drunk a coffee, you would then need to replicate that on the front end, right? Whereas that's exactly the problem, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's exactly yeah. the problem that all of the applications nowadays have. You're changing any kind of logic on your server that, like related to entity actions, which is like, if you just think of any application, there's loads of these, like a web shop with your cart, interacting with your cart, like a, like a timesheet or like our registration application, like all of that kind of stuff. There's so many actions. And you're, you're changing your back end means that you also have to change your front end. So your UI works with the new logic. And if you were to use hey to s or just use links, so your API is sending back links to these actions, your front end would be updated automatically. Right. Okay. So it makes, like you're saying, it makes my UI reactive without really having to do anything. As long as the bit of logic is there that says, if there is this link, show this button, right? I don't need to, it will automatically react because then I change something on the server, bang, my UI changes, I suppose. That's exactly right, yeah. So that maybe, um, 
it might not even sound that like impactful that like wow that's such a different way to think about things but i really like i really really like this approach because if you're thinking of twitter again twitter has like tons of apps available right they have like a like a web app they have like a windows app uh, ios android and all that kind of stuff meaning that they would have to update kind of the same logic in multiple programming languages um multiple tests uh test runs multiple release runs it would save just so much time and money and so much effort if you can just update your backend and magically all of your apps are updated. And I suppose it simplifies things like environments as well, right? So if you've got a dev environment, you don't want to somehow make your dev version of the UI release to prod without changing. Because like in your in your pre in the in the REST way, I, I wonder if REST is the opposite of hate OS, but we'll just call it that for now, for simplicity. In the sort of traditional web API way, if my front end is going to post out to somewhere, it needs to know where to post out to. So my dev build will likely be posting out to a dev server, whereas my prod build, I want it to post out to a prod server. But if I somehow manage to deploy my dev code to the prod server, without changing those URLs in the UI code, then, you know, I'm going to have a bad time. But I suppose if the server is telling me the UI where to post to, or where to get to, where to delete to, then I don't need to worry about that, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, it's, I definite, uh, that is definitely uh, a way to kind of decouple your front end and your back end a bit further. Now, you know, that is kind of... I, that is kind of the theoretical benefit of it, if I'm honest. Um, someone, if a listener here has been thinking, oh, that sounds really useful, um, they might also have a question about a situation where hate os might fall a little bit flat. And that, for example, could be the situation where, well, what does my request body look like? Right? Because hate os doesn't specify that by default. You can do that. But what I like to do is see HateOS as a solution to the problem of duplicate code in your backend and frontend. And um, I would still like to like use a generated API client and specify a URL somewhere because that is not a really a big problem for me. Like it, uh, the, the, the problem is duplicate code. The problem is not for me that the fact that I need to specify a URL to the backend, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure. Okay, I, I, I was just sort of thinking of other ways that it could help. Yeah, no, definitely. It's definitely, definitely useful. I'm just, uh, definitely, yeah, like that. <laughs> so Okay, uh, oh, sorry, you go. No, no, it's fine. I'm just thinking. So one thing that I found interesting, what you just said, is you said that hey to us might kind of be the opposite of uh, a REST API. The fun thing is that in order to have like a fully compliant REST API, you need to implement HateOS, which is something that a lot of people do not actually know. A lot of people say, you know, oh, I'm building a REST API. And then I say, okay, so how are you using like hypermedia in your API? How are you linking to other actions? And they're like, well, I'm not. And then if you look at like kind of the idea of what a REST API is, which was like written by Roy Fielding, um, the idea kind of the inventor of the REST principle, that is not a compliant REST API. Right. Okay. So you're telling me that I'm not restful. I'm. Yeah, you're not rest -like. rest like. <laughs> you're rest like exactly, exactly. Because okay. the entire kind of idea behind rest as well is that you you know uh, there's a lot more order in your applications, and with the idea of rest is that you and the idea of the World Wide Web is that we're using hypermedia, and that's also kind of what Hey to Us is intention is. It's hypermedia as the engine of application state. So instead of um, having the front end kind of the, be the engine of state, like the front end knows what the state is, the front end modifies it. Uh, instead of that, we're now using kind of the server. We're returning the hypermedia, these links, and those are now kind of the thing that drive our application to evolve our models further, if that makes any sense. Do you have a WPF application and want to take it to macOS or Linux? Avalonia XPF, a binary compatible cross-platform fork of WPF, enables WPF apps to run on new platforms with minimal effort and maximum compatibility. 
With a few tweaks to your project file, your WPF app and all of its dependencies are ready for testing on new platforms. Start your app transformation journey with a 30-day free trial. Head over to avaloniaui.net forward slash themodern.net show to get started today. Or press the link in the show notes as it will have the full URL. Sure, that makes sense, right? Because like you say, you're duplicating the code, you're moving the, the that engine, you are moving the uh, the engine that supplies the, the links and the, the kind of the logic to the UI. You're controlling it from from that hypermedia. So then it makes your, I guess, thin clients, is that what it becomes, right? Because I Perfect. just need yeah. to yeah. throw some HTML together with some, maybe the bare bones JavaScript. I maybe don't even need a front end, like a spa front end or anything like that. Um, but then you, you did say something earlier on where you said, I can generate a client. Like, is that something that H2S lets you do? Because, because obviously it's 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 supplying, here's the data and here's some actions for you to perform. Then yeah, is that is that like, what? I could just push a button and and just generate my my front end is that right technically yes the the thing that's a that's also a a, a good like um a good bridge at, um to the next kind of topic about this so the the thing that i meant with like api client of the client generation is more like the the fact that i still like have use open api use swagger to generate an right. api client for me, including the request bodies and stuff like that. So there is a bit of coupling to the front end and back end just because it makes my developer life a lot easier. Um, but you're touching upon the fact that, well, if you're now returning data and we're also returning possible actions to the client, like what use do I have for like a custom application? Can't I just generate an application based on all of that information? Right? That's your point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Is that yeah, and that's that do? is actually that is possible. Um, it never really took off in the sense of when we were turning JSON and then re- create an application based on it. It is definitely possible, but um, and this goes a bit deep into the entire hypermedia uh, movement. Uh, you need uh, you then you also need to kind of make like a hypermedia client that is understand that understands all of this stuff and then renders it the big problem that you can probably imagine with this is that if we're returning like links and the client has to render them it's not very difficult but your application will look very very static very very boring Mm -hmm. right because you just need to define somewhere where to put those links Uh, it probably works like in a web 1.0 scenario but if you need any like kind of customization interaction in your client then this all falls apart okay okay so we we we're, we're still going to need something that uh, is is inherently interactive but it reduces that burden of where to go to get the data and what I can do with that data Am I am I in the, still in the right ballpark? I I, I want to make yeah sure no definitely happy. definitely <laughs> um, if we're thinking uh, like if um, I would love to talk a bit about HDMX later, which is going to touch definitely touch upon more of like creating a thin client and using hypermedia and kind of hate OS is then embedded in that as the driver for your application uh, going kind of back to the roots. But I think it could be good to kind of touch upon that later. Um, but yeah, you still with if we're just using JSON and returning the links as hate OS kind of in your response, you definitely need uh, to have the application understand these links and like, you know, have some logic in your code that kind of still displays the buttons somewhere. Okay. Okay. So it's not a, it's not a, um, what am I looking for? It's not a reason to fire all the front end devs. You still need the front end devs, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you definitely still need the front end devs, but you will um, make the lives of front end devs a whole lot easier. In fact, I've, I've been using this kind of this hate OS principle in lots and lots of applications, and it has made it a lot easier because, you know, instead of having to have all of this logic about, oh, can we, uh, for example, like you said, is it Tuesday? Uh, am I drinking a coffee? And can, am I the owner of a tweet and then I can delete it? All of that logic, just, you know, let the front-end devs check a link and let them do what they do best, right? Like make beautiful front-ends, like use their CSS wizardry, which I 
don't understand to just make that beautiful application. But you know, don't make them uh, yeah, rewrite all of the backend logic in like TypeScript or JavaScript or stuff like that. Sure, sure. I totally get what you mean about uh, CSS wizardry. I literally had to center a div today and had to look it up <laughs> because I just, I just, I can't do it, man. <laughs> I have the same problem. I mean, uh, I can, you know, I can, I can do Angular, I can do React, I can do Vue. But like the second I need to do anything with CSS, it just I just all fall apart. It also makes it difficult for me to think and say like, am I a full stack engineer if I do not really understand CSS? Because I can do front end, but the second someone says, yeah, can you move that button? Then uh, no, no, not really. <laughs> you know, but I can set up like I can set up like the cloud services for you. I can set up like a bit of networking. I can do DevOps. I can do backend. But yeah. Uh, no, CSS, no, not not for me. Thanks. I, I suppose it's like I don't know whether you get this, but I get this a lot. For when family members say to me, "Hey, you're good with computers. Can you set up my phone?" It's like that's that's to me that's the uh, full stack dev who's like, I can't do CSS, but I can do everything else. That's the same thing. Right? <laughs> I can technically do it. I just don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really specialized in it. But I could learn CSS. It's just it's just such a different way of thinking. Yeah, I remember being at a birthday party where a family member stayed just a little bit longer uh, just to wait for me to arrive because he wanted to have laptop <laughs> advice and I gave it and then he left. I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> I was really thinking That's of like, sending an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I'll stay around. I'll stay around just long enough to get my advice, and then I'll leave. Brilliant. Exactly. <laughs> Good to so, see you too. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier on HTMX, right? Right. Because you said it was related to hate hate OS. So let's talk about that, right? So what? It, I, I'm I'm. So I'm cheating, right? But uh, listeners, you already know that when we do this, I do a little bit of research. So I know what HTMX is, but some of you who are listening may not know what HTMX is. So what's HTMX then? Well, I feel like you say that your listeners might not know it, but one of the things that HTMX is currently, it is extremely popular on social media, especially on Twitter, which is kind of why it has right. been exploding and exploding. So if people are like listening to tech podcasts, they might have at least seen a lot of the memes already it kind of got popular because of the memes which i find a very uh interesting marketing strategy for your for your library um <laughs> so hdmx is uh in the principle it's a, it's a javascript library which you can use you know so you uh you can you can use it in your application uh to write a whole lot uh less javascript so you know, in let's let's think back uh, to the good old days, right, where we were writing like uh, Web 1.0 applications, and our servers uh, were simply like we're using like HTML templating engines, which they still do, but nowadays lots of applications are like single page applications, and the server was returning um, HTML, and then the only way we could interact with servers was with like the the anchor element and with like forms, right? So we could do like gets and posts. Which you know, which worked very, very well. But like we clicked on a link, or we submitted a, a form, and then we had to go to the server, and then we, um, you know, we got some HTML back. It worked, and it worked fine, but it wasn't very interactive because then we kind of got to the point where we were like, you know, we want to do some cool client application, but we don't want to reload the page the entire time. And that is kind of where the, the spa movement came along. We want to be able to have a rich interactive application where clicking a button or clicking multiple buttons, the, just a, a bit of the page refreshes, right? That's kind of the web 2.0, I suppose. And that's where it all went wrong. No, but <laughs> um, so, the, so the idea is that, you know, we're like we're now bootstrapping like an Angular, or I guess React is the most popular application. And to, for example, to click on a button, and then we do like lots of React magic, and just to send kind of an API request to get some data or to perform some actions on the server. HDMX to get back to that is simply uh, in the basic form the fact that you can perform um, you can perform like HTTP requests on any element. So you can, for example, perform like an HTTP put request. You can perform 
um, like gets and puts and posts and patches and deletes and all that kind of stuff from any elements, from lots of interactions on the div, on like an H1, on buttons, on P elements, and stuff like that. Okay, so it allows me to add that interactivity to all of my elements using um, new attributes. So, uh, you know, I can have like a, I don't know, a pulling something out of the A check, a, like a delete button, right? I can make a delete button do a delete thing, right? Um, or rather, I can make a button do a delete thing exactly. by adding something, right? There's some magic happens. I can just go splat, this becomes delete, and maybe it knows to post to the, to the delete URL is that is that what's exactly. happening? So, so what we could, for example, do is uh, well, let's just say we're using a button without a form. So the button could have like a, you know like a, I don't even know is it a bracket just like the button element in HTML, and it could you could for example say h x h x dash delete, and then you could like put the URL in there, and then what it would do is it would perform like uh, like a JavaScript request to that URL. And your server could then return HTML and it would swap the changed, um, it would return HTML, sorry, your server would return HTML and it would render the HTML on the page. And it, this is kind of, you know, like a very rich interactive thing to do. We're not like clicking a button and reloading a page, losing all of our state. No, we can still keep state in the front end and keep create rich applications. But now performing, for example, a search in your HTML was simply mm -hmm. using one little attribute instead of having to write like 50 lines of JavaScript. Okay, okay. So I have, we'll go back to our tweet example. We've loaded the tweet. I want to delete the tweet. I've done something in my front end code to add this hx delete attribute with the delete URL. I hit the button, it deletes it. We get a success from the server or we get something from the server. And then that the maybe I'm returning some HTML from the server, like you say. Then the HTML for the tweet and the delete button are then re, uh, I don't want to say re rendered, but the, it's replaced with whatever came back from the server. Okay. Exactly. You could, you could, for example, have like a, a div somewhere, like under the delete button, which is uh, like has an ID, uh, like a delete result. And then you could, for example, say uh, H in your delete button, you could say HX swap. And then um, uh, delete result, and then HTMX would automatically perform that action. When it's done, it would grab the HTML from the server that's returned, and it would put that HTML in that div. It sounds very very simple, but if you're thinking like how this currently works, it is uh, it just you know you're writing literally like one line of code that does a whole lot of interactions for you that you would currently do with JavaScript. Right. Okay. So putting to, cause I know we're going to come back to hate OS in a moment, right? Putting that to one side at the moment, let's say I'm just returning JSON blobs or whatever from the server or whatever. Um, uh, if I'm just using HTMX, I still need something, right? That when it prepares that page template, it knows to put the URLs in. So maybe it's being rendered on the server. Maybe I pull some data and then it renders it in the UI, but I guess because we mentioned Hate OS earlier on, this is where like the two join together and become a superpower, right? Eh, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> um, that's the tricky part. So, um, so, the, so the, the concept of like Hate OS, returning links and stuff like that, um, is kind of the idea of hypermedia. And the and hypermedia, what that is, uh, is kind of it's it's you know returning media like text from a server, but it's interactive. It you can link to stuff. That's the entire idea of hypermedia. So the entire I know this is kind of going on on the tension, but you need to understand the big picture to understand sure. like kind of the relationship or the non-existing relationship between Hate OS and uh, HDMX. So the World Wide Web is basically media which is connected to each other, right? Like I can go to Google, then I can, can click on a link to go to Wikipedia. And then from Wikipedia, I can go to like Twitter or something and it's, it's all connected, right? And what is happening is that your browser is getting all of this hypermedia back 
and it already understands what it needs to do. Your browser is like a hypermedia client. It sees an anchor link, so it knows that when someone clicks on that link, it needs to connect to a new application, which is, for example, Twitter. Sure. So now let's go back to a traditional, like just like a nowadays spa application. We are returning a tweet, which has a user ID. But that isn't real hypermedia because the client doesn't understand what the client doesn't natively understand what that means. Your browser doesn't understand it. It needs the uh, it needs like for example React to then render that to HTML and render that user ID to a link to like uh, open the user ID the user page. Okay. Do you, do you understand the difference? Do you see the the yeah. difference that I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's um. It's, uh, uh, I'm struggling to think of an analogy. Usually I'm pretty good with metaphors and analogies, but I'm, I'm struggling to think of one. Um, but no, I, I, I get what you mean in that, in that, um, yeah, each, I feel like, uh, hate OS takes us back uh, a step to a simpler time where we are just transferring hypermedia around, um, because spas are complicated, right? <laughs> Yeah, so so in the traditional, let, let's think of a banking application. Let's say mm-hmm. that we are loading our bank's application. Our bank applications are still typically pretty you know, old-fashioned. And for example, this one's still just returning HTML. So you can imagine that it's returning an HTML document, which has like a header with like uh, bank details. And it has a couple of, a mm-hmm. uh, bit of information, like my name and my balance. And it has three actions it has an action to like uh, to like um, close account. It has an action to and to uh, and it has an action to send money to another account. Mm-hmm. Right. Imagine that in an HTML sense. That would probably involve some forms and some buttons and some stuff like that. That is already hey to us. The the, right. the the server is returning data with links with actions that can be performed and the browser natively understands this as hey there's a form with a close account button which basically is a hey to us link it's a link to another action okay okay and uh and so so they are separate things but where does htmx come in then because like if i'm going to build the greatest application ever Right, yep. I'm going to have a .NET backend that returns hate OS, and I'm going to magically get HTMX running at the front at the front end, and then I'm going to make the memes about it. How am I, <laughs> how am I pairing those three things up? <laughs> I think in the classical sense, in the way that I use hate OS, is that if I were if I'm using hate OS in my applications, I'm not really using HTMX um, in the front end. I'm using, for example, like Angular or React or stuff like that, and I'm using those JSON HeyToS links um, to render my actions on the client right. based on those links. When I'm using HTMX, uh, my server um, is returning HTML. So we've stepped away from returning JSON. We can still have an API that returns JSON, uh, but for our front end, we're returning HTML again. And the HTML is hypermedia, that already has Hey2S as a principle applied to it. We're returning okay. our banking details with these actions that you can perform on your account. Now, what HDMX allows you to do is instead of you know clicking on that button, reloading the page and stuff like that, we're allowing uh, our browser to say, if someone clicks on that button, perform like a request to the server, and return the HTML and render it without reloading the page, right? Like the old right. good old days of like using AJAX request, XML, HTTP request, and stuff like that. If you're enjoying this show, would you mind sharing it with a friend or colleague? Check out Podcatcher for a link to the show notes, which has an embedded player within it and a transcription and all that stuff, and share that link with them. I'd really appreciate it if you could indeed share the show. But if you'd like a few other ways to support it, you could uh, leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. So if you head over to .net core.show slash review, you'll find loads of ways to do that. You could consider buying the show a coffee. The buy me a coffee link is available on each show's show notes page on the website. This is a one-off financial support option. You could become a patron 
and this is a monthly subscription based financial support option and the link to that is included on each episode show notes page as well i'd love it if you could share the show with a friend or colleague or leave a rating or review the other options are completely up to you and are not required at all to continue enjoying the show anyway let's get back to it Right. Okay. Okay. So like you said earlier on, I guess both H2S and HTMX are greatly reducing the complexity of oh, yes. the front end, right? Because if HTMX is what, sorry, if, if H2S is what the browser already understands and yes. HTMX is, and I'm going to use my own words here, this is not what you've said, supplying me some magic to wire up a delete button to a delete action, right? then yes. my my user interface becomes less complex. So then it becomes faster to innovate with, I guess? Oh, yes, definitely. So to kind of hammer that example home, right? Let's just kind of see if we can explain a search action kind of to, to the listeners. You know, it's always really easy to explain it with code, like on the screen. But of course, some people might be in a car now. So let's, have a th- let's see if we can explain this, you know, with our voices. So Good luck, imagine everyone. if we're... Okay, let's okay. Like, pay attention, but also you know, pay attention to whatever you're doing. Um, we're writing a search function in our application, so we're searching, for example, a recipe application for like the most nice dinner uh, recipes that you can imagine, and we're doing this in a React or Vue or Angular, a modern spa application that involves quite a bit of JavaScript. Right, we need to have something that listens to some. Uh, so some like input box where there's input coming in. We need to then send an HTTP request somewhere. We need to track the state so we can, for example, like uh, put a loading indicator uh, on or off when the request is done or the request fails. Mm-hmm. We need to handle uh, like request successes and request failures. When the when the request comes back and we get a response, we need to grab that JSON and we need to map that to the results. And then we need to, you know, split that somewhere. So the, it, the response is re-rendered on the screen. Sure. Sounds like a whole lot of stuff I just said, right? For pretty, for a pretty simple feature. Yeah, that's, that's a ton of stuff. And that's before you start thinking about, well, um, what about if my API contract changes and the model changes, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So now with HTMX and the entire, like the, the power of hypermedia, what we're doing is we have, for example, an input. We have an input element. And then we can, we can, we can say uh, hx-get, and then we put in the URL, so where the search action would be. So like um, slash uh, search. And then we would also say um, HX delay 500 milliseconds. So after someone stops typing for 500 milliseconds, grab the inputs from the um, uh, from the well, grab the text from the inputs and send it to that URL. And then we could still grab like the HX swap, and it said uh, replace the uh, the swap the HTML that's returned, replace that in the results, the search results. So that's basically three attributes to replace all of that stuff that I just rambled on about. And we can just replace all of that logic with three like little bits of HTML. Right, okay. And I mean, it makes sense that you can do that, right? Because it's gonna be the same code every single time, right? Um, we're gonna we're gonna wrap, our, we're gonna build, if, if we were doing it in a spa or a JavaScript application context, we would perf- we would have code that performs a, a get um, code that parses a response, code that um, uh, parses whether it was a success or failure, um, code that does some branching thing. We don't need to do any of that anymore because we just literally let HTMX deal with it for us, right? Exactly. And we're just using the power of our server to just, which already has all of the data, it knows, you know, what the search results are. And that is just returning a bit of HTML instead of JSON. And you know, it's being rendered on the client again. So it's the good old days of building pretty simple applications, but still having uh, very customizable front ends. 
So it's like, it's a really good, you know, a good handshake between like the good old backend developers saying, you know, it was so much better back in my days and the front end developers saying, you know, but I want to build rich applications. HTMX is like a, a really, really good solution for this. And it's gaining a lot of traction. So does that mean then that my, because my backend server needs to return some HTML, does the server then need to know about what the UI looks like, like what the UI is doing? I mean, it would anyway, because it's still returning the HTML for the original page. But like before I can, as a, as a server side, a backend engineer, I then need to get the, get the data from the database. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take the, um, the get request. I'm going to get all of the things I need from the get request to then go into the database, perhaps get the data from the database. It comes back as a list of things. I then need to iterate through that list of things and generate an HTML string or just a string that is some HTML and send that back over the wire, right? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So what you can do with HTMX or I kind of, I think it's really simple. It's again, just like one or two attributes is that, you know, you're just sending form data like we're used to do in the good old days. I'm just going to keep saying that because it sounds nice. So <laughs> it is all kind of already handled by the browser because the browser knows how to do this stuff. The browser knew that since the browser was invented, how to send stuff to the server. And HTMX mm -hmm. is just kind of extending the entire model of HTML. Like, you know, why does HTML only support like get and post? Why can't it be more interactive? Because that was the problem. Or for, and that is why spas were invented. And now you can just do so much more while you're just, you know, depending on the browser itself when you're depending on HTML. Okay, okay. So my server still needs to... So, yeah, so from a back-end perspective, all I'm doing is I'm swapping returning JSON for returning HTML. That's it. Exactly, and exactly. magic happens. Yes. And then right, the magic right. just happens. And it is, um, yeah, you can, you can look at this in a lot of different ways. A lot of people, when they learn about this concept, is the first, and maybe that's also a question that you have in your head, so I'm curious if, if you've thought about this yet, is, well, what if I want to build a mobile app, right? Mm -hmm. So what the, the, if you go to the website, you don't have to do this now, but for a listener that might be interested in this concept, so the website from HDMX, which is hdmx.org, I believe, what you can do, this is based on the information uh, from those essays, um, is you can have two different kinds of APIs now. You can have, for example, a data API, which is returning like JSON or HTML, stuff like that. You can have some multiple APIs depending on the client. And you can also just have like a one application API, which has all of the actions. So like the tweet, retweeting, the deleting and stuff like that. That might also maybe still be JSON and stuff like that. But that way you could, for example, still have one backend that can serve multiple clients, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. So I'm imagining, um, you know, you mentioned it earlier on, let's say we've got a Twitter app or an X app or whatever. Um, maybe we don't have an X app because the iOS store requires app names to be more than one letter. So we've got a Twitter <laughs> app, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we've got a Twitter desktop app. We've got a Twitter um, iOS app, a Twitter, um, uh, Android app, like you said earlier on, they're all communicating with that one same API, but maybe there's an endpoint that's returning pre-formatted HTML, and maybe there's another endpoint that's returning just the links for, like you said, those buttons, right? So I push the button for compose a tweet, I type out HTMX is awesome, smiley face, smiley face, smiley face, and I hit tweet the link for the tweet button has come from the API that just sent yeah. me the links you that could be I'm allowed to use, right? Perfect. Yeah. So you're like the, your, your API for your app that might not be using HTMX could still be using JSON and like this concept of eight of hate OS where we're returning links. So even the iOS app can still be a thin client where then your browser application could, for example, be using HTMX with HTML to make that an even thinner client. Okay, that's pretty cool. So then, um, so then, how do I go about doing this in a .NET context? Right? Am I? Uh, do I need to import any kind of specific libraries in a .NET app to get the HateOS concept? I know you're saying it's a concept; it's the good old days. But maybe um, uh, you know, I'm a lazy developer. I just want to go NuGet install some great uh, NuGet that will do all for me. 
Um, and if I'm doing HTMX, I can't imagine I'd need to do anything special with my .NET APIs, right? I'm just returning HTML. I'm taking a thing and returning HTML, right? Yeah, so the good, uh, let's talk about that hate os thing first, because I always, like I said, I think it's kind of two different approaches to building applications. So for hate os um, it's a standard, and there are, for .NET applications, there are lots of uh, packages available. First, I'm going to have to plug myself a little bit here. So I'm current, it's currently Hacktoberfest, and uh, you know I've been working at a, during Hacktoberfest on like a hate os library, um, which you can find at... Uh, well, would you want me to do a link here or are you going to put it in the show notes? Oh, all, all of the links that you mentioned, I'll put in the show notes. So, you right, know, so, um, so okay. we'll need to refer to it somehow, but yeah, it's on GitHub, I guess. Yeah, so, so it's on GitHub uh, github.com slash arcadeit slash municio. Um, if you just Google my name and then kind of HateOS stuff, you'll, you'll find it. And But there's also other libraries like riskfirst.hateOS. And what these libraries allow you to do in a, in a modern .NET application is to just use HateOS very, very simply. So it's like almost no work to add this kind of stuff to your application. And any front end that you'll have currently built will be very, very thankful for doing that. It's super, super simple. Right, okay. Uh, just before you move on, um, I guess if I'm writing a web application that is... Um, uh, grabbing some JSON from somewhere and suddenly the API swaps to doing uh, hate OS. Let's say they're just returning a JSON blob with some links. I don't have to change anything. I just ignore the links, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's backwards compatible. And that is uh, that is also just a little little thing that I want to touch upon. So we talked about like, you know, like maintaining your Twitter application. But what if mm -hmm. You have third-party applications, like Twitter also does. Like you have Owly and Talon and stuff like that. Those are third-party applications. Any changes you make to the logic of your backend um, could break those applications because they you can't update those, right? There are those front ends you cannot update. So the power of HateOS could be that you could return a delete link, and then all of these third-party applications, if they want, can use that delete link to determine if deletion is allowed. So you can change your server and say only on Fridays you can delete tweets, and even the third-party applications will be updated, which is just like kind of, when I kind of realized that, it was kind of mind-blowing to me. <laughs> right. Okay. So so to continue, right? So uh, we, we talked a little bit about HateOS and .NET. Um, so HTMX is a JavaScript library, meaning that, you know, it works in PHP, it works with uh, Java, but it, of course, it works best with .NET, as we all know. No, but um, of course. So there are lots and lots of uh, really, really good um, examples and libraries available. So you have a, on GitHub, you can find a project called hdmx.net, um, which is kind of uh, a library that makes it a lot easier to work with like uh, Razor, like uh, Razor Pages and uh, like ASP.NET Core MVC and kind of attach some HDMX stuff to it. And uh, if you look at that library, you will also find an amazing little workshop that the creator of that has created that teaches you the concept of HDMX and how to use it within .NET. Like it takes maybe an hour or two of your time and you will, your, your thinking patterns of building applications will just completely change. It was really, really mind blowing to me. So I definitely recommend that. Right, okay. So you, you're, you're lighting up parts of my brain that are like, hey, HTMX seems very jam stacky, but without the yeah. jam, it's just like without the J for the jam, right? It's then just your API is a markup, right? It's an AM stack. <laughs> is that a yeah, thing? Yeah, sure. Probably exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because it, it, it really, if it hasn't clicked for a listener yet, just kind of, you need to kind of start thinking back, like exactly what you say, like, why are we building all of these paths? Why are we doing so much complex work on the front end to build a little to-do application? Well, it's just because of the interactivity that we want. And HDMX allows you to do that. Now, HDMX might not work for all of the applications. Same goes for HateOS. If the application is like super, super interactive and like has tons of real-time updates, it might still be better to use with JSON and stuff like that. It depends on your model. Um, but HDMX also allows you to integrate with your current JavaScript code base. So if anything, 
if HDMX does not work for like a specific part, you can still fall back to JavaScript. And that is also a completely still thing, good thing to do. Just something that I still wanted to throw out there. So it's not that it is the best way, the only way to do web-based applications. It's just, hey, get this tool in your toolbox and someday it might prove useful, right? Exactly, exactly that. And even if it doesn't really prove useful to you, like right away, um, it will just, like you said, it will just kind of light up different parts of your brain, which it really, really has for lots and lots of people in the community, um, which is really, really fun to see. Yeah, and I think I think it's always worth investigating um, technologies that fit slightly outside of your use case, because then A, you see how other people are doing it, but then B, you get um, a, be- a greater appreciation for other ways to solve the same problem, because like, there is no one way to solve every problem, right? Exactly. No, you're completely right. Um, I really like um, talking to people about exactly like this, like kind of looking at different tools. So I talk to people and then, and then I look at the modern front end technologies, right? And then there's like partial hydration and hydration and like islands and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, what is happening? I just want to put an image on a screen. And then, you know, <laughs> there is HTMX, which is just kind of like you go back to the, you know, to the, the Stone Age times and we're just returning HTML again. And it's just so very easy and, you know, it works and it just works. And it's just so much easier for uh, someone to grasp and kind of come to terms with. Sure. And I mean, I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Okay. Well, I mean, it's been an amazing conversation with you, Sander. Um, What about getting in touch with you? Are you, we talked a lot about Twitter or whatever they're calling (laughs) it these days. Are you on Twitter? Are you like, do you prefer people getting in touch on LinkedIn? Like, like somebody's listening to this and going, I need to talk to that guy. He's he's making me think about web development differently and I want to go have a chat with him. How do they get in touch? No, well, you can definitely reach me on Twitter. So on Twitter, I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, Sander Ten Brinke. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn, uh, on my website, uh, stuff like that. I think those three are the, definitely the main best ones to get in contact with me. And uh, that is also the ones where I'm most active. So yeah, feel free to reach out. I'd love that. Uh, another thing you can do if you're interested in this entire topic of hate OS is uh, read my blog post about it. So um, I, on my website, uh, s10brinky.nl, because that's the good English pronunciation for it, um, is you can find uh, my blog post about hate OS there and even how, how you integrate it with .NET in multiple different ways and exactly what the benefits are. So I definitely recommend checking that out as well. Awesome. There'll be a link to that in the in the show notes. So press through on your app of choice and definitely give that a read. Um, I can I can definitely uh, recommend uh, Sunday's um, uh, blog posts. Uh, I really enjoyed the uh, the configuration one you wrote. It was like everything you need to know about configuration in .NET. It was uh, really really good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just, I'm real so really really happy with that one. It's it's been doing quite well. So yeah, it's definitely one, like one of my my proud blogging moments. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you very much for being with us uh, this evening, Sonda. I really, really appreciated it. I'm now going to go away and I'm going to rethink how I've, I've got this. Okay. So real quick, I've got this app that I've written. It's an API and a UI, right? And it is just literally a search. It's show me a list of books from this very small subset of books and allow me to search through it. Like, that's an HTMX app right there, right? Yeah, that's, no like three, complicated... that's like three attributes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go and do that this evening. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun, man. You should do it. Awesome, awesome. Well, like I said, thank you ever so much for being on the show. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. It was really, really fun to be here. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Modern.net show with me, Jamie Taylor. I'd like to thank this episode's guest, Sander Tebrinke, for graciously sharing his time, expertise, and knowledge. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Head over to .netcore.show slash review for ways to do that. Reach out via our contact page at .netcore.show slash contact 
or join our Discord server over at .netcore.show slash Discord, all of which are linked in the show notes. But above all, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, and I hope I'll see you again next time for more .NET goodness. See you again real soon. See you later, folks. <laughs>